In this video, we're gonna open, unbox, and set up the M-Audio M-Track Solo audio interface. This audio interface is in the lower end of most people's budget, so if you are looking for current pricing or specs for this device, if you're interested in this device, or any of the additional accessories that we need when we're working with this device to set it up to get it working with our computer, we have links to everything that you'll see in this video down in the description below from a variety of online retailers to make sure that you are getting the best price possible. So here I have the box, it just came to me, just bought this item last week. And so let's just take a quick look at the box, logo, product name on the top. On the side here we have an image of the M-Track Solo. It, goes through all the specs and everything that we're going to walk through on the device itself. On the side you have a photo of the product as well. On the other side you have more specs there that you can read. It's all stuff that you'd find on the website and then we have some compliant stuff on the bottom of the box. Now we can open this box up and find out what's inside. Now if you do have any questions about this product, I do want to know what your biggest questions are. I'm assuming that this video won't answer everything that you're wanting to know about this device. So please do leave a comment down in the comment section below and we will make follow-up videos with answers to the questions that we do receive. As we open the box here, you can find that we do have some documentation. Just going to take a quick look here. It is telling us that we're going to need some drivers. So to go to M Audio, this website for the drivers, we're going to try it. Most audio interfaces are compliant with Mac without drivers, but if you're a PC user, you'll definitely want to do this. We're going to try it without. If it doesn't work, then we'll have to download the drivers to make it work. Some warranty cards or download the included instructions on how to download the software. And here's the user guide. We're going to try figure it out ourselves. And here is safety instructions and warranty information. It does come with a one year warranty. Next, we have the product itself. You can see it here. We're going to pull it out. And in the bottom, we have a USB cable as well. We get rid of that box. Pull this off. Get rid of the foam. So this is wrapped in plastic with a bag of silica gel underneath it. And this is a standard USB a to B cable here. For our video, since my Mac is USB-C, I will be using a different cable. So you do want to know that if you have a USB-C laptop, that you would need to buy your own USB-C to USB type B cable. We'll have links down in the description below if you're looking for something like that as well. My first impressions are that holding this product here, it does feel quite a bit lighter weight than something like a Focusrite Scarlett or a SSL 2 Plus. It feels it is plastic on the top, plastic on the side. It kind of has this brushed look, but it feels like it's plastic to me. So it is definitely on the lighter weight side. Uh, it seems like it's built well overall. So on the top here, we have logo and the controls. So here's how you'd control the volume for your two inputs here. So we do have input one is a combi jack that has XLR and a line level input that you can switch between. So if you're using quarter inch here, it will assume that it's a line level input. And if you're using XLR, it will assume that it's a mic level input. The second input channel here is another line level input that can be switched to instrument mode. Now I haven't gone into the specs, but typically when you go to an instrument mode, it will adjust the gain and the impedance to more resemble what it's expecting from an electric guitar or electric bass plugged straight into an audio interface. So if you ever find that your sound is quite chunky or something like that from a line level input, there's a really good chance that you're accidentally in instrument mode. Beside that, we have the phantom power switch here. So you would want to turn that on anytime you're using a condenser microphone like the Audio-Technica AT2020. If you're using an inline preamp like a cloud lifter or a FET head or something like that, you would need the phantom power turned on. But if you're just using a dynamic microphone, it's best practice to leave it off. It's not likely to damage the microphone, but it can damage the microphone. It'd be like a thousand to one shot. So it is best practice to leave that turned off. 
You do have your headphone jack here on the front of the device, which is actually quite nice. Some manufacturers put that on the back, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then the output here is whether or not you want direct output or USB. Now this output switch here, I did just look it up for a little bit more information. This direct to USB switch is controlling what output you're getting from your headphone jack or your main outputs on the back. So if it's on USB, you will only be able to monitor what's coming from your computer. And if it's on direct, you'll get the zero latency monitoring of what's happening on the device as you capture. So there is no blend knob that other audio interfaces have where you can mix between those two. You have to decide whether or not you're wanting to listen to what's coming from your USB or what is being recorded direct on the device itself. Now on the back of the device, we can see that the main outs here are RCA only. This does not have quarter inch or XLR outputs. So it's an unbalanced line level RCA output and it has a USB type B connection. As we said before, it comes with the USB type B to A for most computers. But if your computer is on the newer end, you're gonna wanna go out and buy your own USB type B to USB C cable. Uh, that's what we're going to be using to connect everything today. On the sides, we just have bare plastic. On the bottom of the device, we do have serial number, some compliance information, and four rubber feet to help insulate it so it's not banging around on your desk so much and to help stop it from sliding. It's not doesn't feel like it's likely to slide here on us. And we did not talk about the output knob here. We kind of got carried away when we started talking about inputs, but the output knob would obviously adjust the headphone output or the RCA outputs on the back. Now let's connect this audio interface to our computer, try to get some microphones working. We'll test some headphones, a uh, speaker here, and we'll talk about who this device is for, who this device is not for, then we'll recap all the accessories and things that you will need to make your device work. So as I described a couple times before, we're gonna use this USB Type-B to USB-C cable. I had to buy this on my own because my computer is USB Type-C. We're gonna connect that to the back. And we're gonna connect it to the computer. Now we can see right here that in my sound settings, it did come up right away as USB audio codec. It doesn't say M audio, it doesn't say M track solo. I'm assuming that right now my Mac is trying to give it a generic USB driver. As I said at the very beginning, I'm assuming I can get a more accurate driver if I go to the website here to download it, but I am gonna try to see if I can make this work without. Now we do notice here, I did see some lights flicker when I plugged it in. I'm just gonna quickly turn on the phantom power uh, button here to make sure that I do have connectivity. You can see things are lighting up. So this device does seem to be accurately powered. So right off the bat, let's start with a condenser microphone. I'm assuming this will be a little bit easier uh, for this device to power. So we're gonna take this, it is an XLR microphone. I'm gonna connect my XLR cable, male to female, to the bottom of my Audio-Technica AT2020 condenser microphone. And on the front of the device here, I'm going to connect that XLR cable. Now this is a condenser microphone, so like all condenser microphones, we do need to turn phantom power on in order to activate this microphone. So we can see phantom power is on. You can see it's getting some signal there. I'm assuming it'll turn red when it clips. That's what it's saying there when it says signal slash clip. So I'm going to open up Logic and open up a new project. I'm going to select the USB audio codec as my recording device. It's going to ask what I want. I want audio input one because we're in audio input one there. Hit create. I'm going to turn on the tracking. So we can see we are getting signal there. I'm going to hit record now. So you can see here that I am coming in on the peak meter here around minus 34 dB, something like that. So we're gonna turn this up until we get somewhere between minus 18 and minus 12 dB. So I'm gonna keep turning up, 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 up. And there we go. So we're at minus 15.4 dB. Now, one thing I do wanna point out here is I'm about a fist away from this microphone, maybe just a little bit more. For a condenser microphone, to have to turn it up to seven out of 10 is quite high. The 
M Audio M Track Solo here has 54 dB of gain. That is quite low to all the other competitors on the market. This would compare to something like an XLR to USB cable, but it's a little bit better than that, obviously, in terms of noise and quality and that type of thing. But it's not, obviously, and it's priced appropriately, it's not quite as much gain as something like a Focusrite Scarlet 2i2. Typically, if I have the Audio-Technica AT2020, most audio interfaces would be somewhere between four and five in terms of effort of the preamp to get this microphone where I want it to be. You can see here I'm peaking at minus 12, which is right where I want to be, and this is working pretty hard. So what we're going to do next is we're going to try to see if we can get it working on the Shure SM7B. I think I already know the answer, but then we are going to try it with the cloud lifter to see if that we can get it to work a little bit better for the Shure SM7B. So I'm going to turn this down. I'm going to turn phantom power off. Unconnect the microphone. And then I am going to plug in the Shure SM7B. So I'm just going to go for it and turn it all, all the way up to 10 here. I'm going to reset my peak meter, check 1, 2. Oh, I can get to minus 7. That's pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to go minus, I'm going to go to 9 here. Check 1, 2. Check, check, 1, 2. So for some reason at 9, I'm getting, yeah, it's really sensitive when you go from 9 to 10 there. It seems like it's not doing super well. And then when you go just past, barely past 9, it jumps. So it's really hard to kind of dial it in there. But let's go 9 out of 10. It's working pretty good, but it's minus 24 when you're at 9 out of 10. Once you go over, it seems like it's just giving it a massive boost, but it's kind of unpredictable if you go past 9 out of 10. I'm assuming right now that you're going to hear a pretty good deal of noise when the preamp is working at 9 out of 10. So I'm just going to stop for a minute so you can hear the noise that's coming through the system. I'm going to boost it. I'm going to put some notes on how much I'm boosting it just so you can hear the background noise from the preamp when it's working this hard. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm not happy with it being at minus 24. So what I'm going to do is I am going to connect the cloud lifter now. So I'm going to disconnect this. So I'm going to connect the cloud lifter now goes to the M-Track Solo. I'm going to use a new XLR cable here. To connect the SM7B. And then I need to turn on phantom power. Check, check, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. Reset my peak meter. Check, check, one, two. So you can see now with the cloud lifter, I can come down to about eight out of 10. Check, check, one, two. So you can see here with the cloud lifter at about eight out of 10, now I'm hitting where I want to be, somewhere between minus 18 and minus 12 on my recording. So that is pretty good. So right there is a pretty good demonstration of what a cloud lifter does. We were at nine out of 10 before, and we were getting minus 24 dB on the computer. Now that we have the cloud lifter in, we're at eight out of 10, so less work from the preamp here, and we're getting right where we need to be. We're actually a little bit hot, peak there at minus eight, so I can come down. So somewhere between seven and eight is a really good level for this. So I would say that if you are planning on running the Shure SM7B, the Rode Pod mic, the EVRE20, maybe even a Shure SM58, you might want to consider the cloud lifter with this device. That being said, I'm sure that you're doing some math here. The price of the cloud lifter or other inline preamp, if you're going to need a device like that, this will pretty much knock you up into that next class of audio interface. You can get something like the Elgato Wave XLR, which is a XLR preamp for your computer if you're just wanting microphones. That has 75 dB of gain. That would give you a much better signal. So that is something to consider there. But we can get it all working with the M-Audio M-Track Solo. Next, I'm just gonna quickly test my headphones. I do wanna see how much level I can get. So it is an eighth inch or 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. It's not quarter inch. 
And then I'm going to play some music here. Okay, so right now I'm using 250 ohm headphones, the Biodynamic DT990 Pro. These are notoriously pretty hard to power. A lot of people complain that their audio interface cannot power these headphones. At 5 out of 10, just playing canned music from Apple Music, I'm getting a pretty good level with them. So I would say that it does have a pretty good quality headphone preamp. Now we're going to quickly connect it to a speaker here just to make sure that that works as well. Let me turn this down. As I mentioned at the very beginning, this does have RCA outputs, which is a little bit rare now in this time. Most people will have quarter inch outputs. So that gives you two options. If you have a device like this, this is an M audio speaker. You can see I have two sets of inputs here. I have quarter inch or RCA. So you have two options with a speaker like this. You could use an RCA cable. It's a little antiquated, but it does still work. Or you can use an RCA to quarter inch. We're just going to use a standard RCA cable just to see if we can get this working. Get that plugged in. Seems to be pretty good. Then we're going to connect the other end to the back of my speaker. And then I'm going to play some music again. So I'm going to turn the volume on my speaker up to about 50%. And there you go. So it does work with the monitor outputs as well. And you can see here, if you did want a second speaker, you just connect it to this. There's a million different monitors. We have some other videos coming out on how to connect studio monitors to an audio interface. But I did just want to test it and show you how to connect everything for the purposes of this video to make it complete. So I would say to answer the questions that you might be looking for, what accessories do I need? The first one is if you're using a computer that has USB-C, you'll need your own USB-C to USB-B cable. We'll have some links down in the description below. You don't need any type of 3.5 millimeter to quarter inch input. The headphone jack uh, output of the M-Track Solo is 3.5 millimeter or eighth inch, so it'll work with most standard headphones. You will need an RCA cable or RCA to quarter inch cable to connect this to studio monitors. Some studio monitors will come with that cable for you. You will, of course, need your own microphone, stand, and XLR cable. We have some recommendations of the stuff that we like down in the description below. You may or may not need your own headphones, and you will need your own computer and recording software if you're wanting to record. So who is this device for? I would say that this device is for anybody looking for quick connectivity of an XLR microphone or maybe some line level inputs like a keyboard or electric guitar. If you're just learning guitar, there's so many like cool software platforms now where you can learn to play guitar. You can connect it to your computer and there's online lessons and libraries. If you're that person, this is an awesome device for you. Who is this not for? If you're just looking to connect a microphone to your computer, I would say that you should go with something like the Elgato Wave XLR. It is a little bit more expensive, but you won't need as much outboard gear in order to make everything work, but it doesn't have those instrument level inputs. Basically, if you spend a hundred bucks more, you can get quite a bit more, but if you're on a budget, then this device hits the spot perfectly. So it really depends if you're just wanting to test things out and get going before you step up to the next level, then this is an awesome introductory audio interface. It's much better in my opinion than something like uh, what comes from Behringer, the UM2 I believe it's called. This is a better product and a better way to get started. Again, if you are looking for pricing or specs for anything that you've seen in this video, we have tons of links down in the description below. I do want to hear your biggest questions about this device. If you have more questions, please leave a comment down in the comment section below. And if you want to see more videos like this in the future, please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.